Welcome to another edition in Farah's Building Bite Size Videos, aiming to introduce you in short, digestible chunks to litigation issues. I'm Peter Savory. I'm a tenant at Farah's Building and I have a broad based practice, including personal injury. I act for both claimants and for defendants. Now, if you've been watching some of our other videos, you'll see they are mostly recorded in one of our conference rooms at Farah's Building. I'm based down in Sussex, so I've slightly spoiled the whole image by making my recording here at home. But please do imagine some wholesome sea air pervading this video as a fair exchange for bound volumes of the law reports that you would see behind me if I was at Farah's building. My topic today is schedules of loss, particularly those that accompany personal injury claims. And I'll be looking at three questions, really. Why do we need one? How should we present it? And what's going to go in it? First and most obviously, how will the defendant know what you want? That is not intended as a flippant remark. Uh, claims change, claims develop, complex medical situations result and the values may change. And we've all experienced applications good and bad for increased value, resistance to the same and new evidence. It happens. But first principles are important. Limitation in personal injury claims allows for a decent period to quantify matters pre-issue. So formally, therefore, a schedule of loss needs to accompany the particulars of claim. And the practice direction, practice direction 16 says, the claimant must attach to his particulars of claim, a schedule of details of any past and future expenses and losses which he claims. I'm going to say straight away, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's a matter of style with simpler claims where perhaps the special damages are limited to one or two past items only, whether or not the schedule of loss is actually a separate document. It does appear to be entirely acceptable to include one or two items only within the body of the particulars of claim. And I do so, for example, when it might be a couple of items of damaged clothing resulting from a road traffic accident. But more broadly speaking, when dealing with complex heads of loss, where more detail is required, much better to have it as a separate document. You will, of course, in preparing your claimant documents, be considering the value of the claim from the outset, as you have to include a statement of value on both the claim form and in the particulars of claim. And some early drafting of the schedule of loss is going to assist you to do that. If you're in a position of having received a liability admission from the defendant, the pre-action protocol for, for PI claims, paragraph eight, it's in the white book, uh, sets out that the claimant should send to the defendant a schedule of past and future losses which are claimed, even if the schedule is necessarily provisional, uh, and that schedule should contain as much detail as is reasonably practicable. Timing of the sending of the schedule is of course an issue. It's very rare not to send a schedule of loss of some kind at the same time as the claim form, particulars of claim, it is possible to seek dispensation. But given the parties should be spending some time in pre-litigation correspondence before issue of the claim, some of that time will be, or should be, taken to attempt to quantify the claim. As I've said earlier, ongoing losses and medical developments can present a challenge. But at minimum, identifying the different heads of loss which the claimant reasonably has something to recover is important. Now, before we consider the content of the schedule of loss, a brief word about format. There is no specified format within the civil procedure rules. Over time, you will develop your own style, you will use your own templates, and you will see and respond to better presentation by others. You will also see the different styles that counsel whom you instruct are using and may take a view as to what you prefer. 
Some schedules are sent out as Word documents or similar, some are produced in Excel, and some use software programs of which there are several. It's a matter of personal taste. A schedule is often a work in progress though, and when it's issued, it's likely to be editable in the future. So in making a decision as to how to produce the schedule, decide on something that means you can make those edits without too much difficulty later on. My own schedules are produced in Word. I drag in tables of calculations from Excel where necessary, and they're live linked. So if I make a change in the Excel table, it's going to show up in the Word document. That might be, for example, a calculation to rating, uh, relating to care, where there will be a number of different rates, periods, and numbers of hours claimed. However you do it though, be clear and follow a logical progression. Make your document readable, make it user-friendly. Make it friendly to someone who's reading it for the first time and not to somebody who has lived with the claim for a period of time. You as the solicitor in charge of the claim, perhaps your counsel with whom you're working, will have seen the papers for a reasonable period of time, perhaps a considerable period of time. The defendant is getting the schedule for the first time, so don't take anything for granted. And frankly put, a visually pleasing schedule is a schedule that can be taken seriously by both the defendant and the court alike. By the defendant when they're considering their defence and their counter schedule, and by the court, not at trial, but probably when they're first considering allocation. Whatever software you're using, I recommend a short introductory section with some figures, claimant's date of birth, the date of the index incident, the date of the schedule, i.e. to which your ongoing losses are prepared, and things that relate to Ogden table matters, assume dates of retirement and so on and so forth. They can all be set out at the beginning, especially where that core information is then needed at various points throughout the schedule. If you link it all up, a change at the beginning section is going to be reflected elsewhere in the schedule. And when you get to the end of the schedule, however many pages it's going to be, a single page, usually an Excel table, just summarizing the heads of loss and the total claimed in respect of each with the grand total is very useful. And do remember it's a pleading, it should be signed with a statement of truth, either by you acting for your claimant or by the claimant. So what's going to go in the schedule? Well, obviously anything you want to claim for, anything the claimant wants to claim for, that you're instructed to do so. I say everything that is reasonably arguable should be in there, whether in terms of what it is and the amount. Uh, plainly, if it's not on the schedule, you're not going to get it. What a claimant tells you they want to recover, they may not be recoverable in law. It may be exaggerated. Conversely, it may not be the full extent of what could be recovered. A lay client is very rarely going to be in a position to think through all their potentially recoverable losses and how to quantify those without professional assistance. Avoid including matters which at more than a cursory glance are unsustainable or which are contrary to the evidence. A good medical report or reports will often have made mention of some of the past and future matters which are likely to be claimable. Phrases along the lines of, as a result of this incident, the claimant can no longer do the following and as a result needs whatever it might be, care and assistance. A helpful medical report will assist you in preparing the schedule of loss. Avoid including things for which there is no evidence. One of my tests is imagining the final hearing. The claimant is there, present with a witness statement. All the possible documents and reports are before the court and defendant counsel is there seeking to bear down on the damages that the defendant is going to pay. Is what's on your schedule realistic? Or is a judge going to raise a metaphorical eyebrow with words to the effect of looking at me on behalf of the claimant? Come on, Mr. Savory. So pursuing completely unsustainable heads of loss or sums which are never going to be awarded 
is unwise and in some circumstances can lead to costs issues. And as we all know, at its highest, if a major item on a schedule of loss is found to be untrue, fundamentally dishonest, that can potentially lead to an application dismissing the entirety of the claim. Having said all that, it's always better to put the defendant on notice of a head of loss, even if the detail is not yet available, than to leave something out entirely. But do beware schedules with lots of TBC to be confirmed. Claims are often issued on the cusp of limitation, often for a very good reason. But even at that point, whilst it might be impossible to finalise a schedule, something can be said. Even if no definitive figures are given, I prefer to give some background as to what might be later updated as to quantum, and perhaps more importantly, a short narrative as to why it's been impossible at this point to quantify the heads of loss. That gives the defendant some certainty that you have a legitimate claim under the, that head of loss, that you're working on it, they can see some background, and there might be an indication of likely quantum. Too many blanks can quite rightfully allow a defendant to make costs arguments if the claim goes all the way to trial, that they were never in a position to take a reasonable commercial view to deal with the matter prior to trial because there was no detail on which the claimant was seeking to rely. Remember, ultimately, litigation can be a process by which claimant and the defendant can collaborate to reach the correct settlement for the claimant. And that is in part based on information being provided. Now, it's not possible within the context of this talk to give an all-inclusive list of possible heads of loss. Every case is different, but as a starting point only, most schedules are going to include some or all of the following. First and most obviously, general damages for PSLA. It's a matter of taste as to how much detail you set out in the particulars of claim, how much you repeat or add in your schedule of loss, and how much referral you make to the various medical reports and how much you precy those medical reports. Sometimes it's a legitimate uh, tactic in a schedule to actually put a value on the general damages. Sometimes better to leave it for a decision of the court, merely setting out perhaps what you value the claim at and no more. Of course, for all of these heads of losses, interest should be considered. On general damages, we know that the starting point is 2% from the date of issue of the claim. Past expenses, these are perhaps easier than future expenses, easier to get evidence, easier to know what's going on, ideally before you issue the claim. Medical expenses, travel and transport costs, either to medical appointments or additional matters that have resulted from the index accident. Transport might be, for example, that someone who used to take their child to school can no longer do so taxis having to be provided. Do remember, of course, that transportation and travel to litigation appointments, getting to your medical expert, is not recoverable. Damage to clothes and property, self-evident. Loss of earnings, hopefully at this point, reasonably easy to quantify. The claimant will have had a period where they didn't attend work. Hopefully they've got wage slips or similar demonstrating that they might think that they haven't suffered a loss of earnings. But it's worth checking their employer may over time have reduced what they have paid, they've been reliant on sick pay, many different variations, worth checking all of the figures. Loss of pension alongside loss of earnings. It might be wrapped up within the employer's details or the claimant might have their own private pension into which they've been unable to continue to make payments. And care and assistance whether that's been provided by professionals or by other friends or family members. Important to quantify that, realistically, of course. And ultimately, it might be a requirement to have some evidence of the same if the claim is reasonably large. 
Future expenses. Well, this, of course, is where the calculations start to get more complex. The Ogden tables are at the forefront of what is being asked. They consider the longevity of the claimant, the need for payment of sums to notional retirement dates or to notional death, or perhaps on a periodic basis. Ongoing future losses of even a modest annual sum for a middle-aged claimant can amount to very large sums once they're multiplied up, as I say, to the notional retirement date or notional death date. Care must be taken to correctly calculate those. What is the annual loss? So what is the starting point for the calculation? And what is the multiplier for each of those annual losses? Uh, a slip of a few pounds one way or the other at the outset can result in many thousands of pounds difference at the end of the schedule. It's important to be accurate, not only so the claimant doesn't suffer a reduction in their damages, but also the other way. So the defendant's first response is, I'm sorry, but these figures are wrong. Loss of earnings. Can the claimant work at all? Or is this a claim where they can work to a lesser degree? And what can be reasonably suggested as their likely future income? Always a very tough calculation to do, particularly the reduced income position. The claimant may not know. The claimant's medical situation may be changing over time. Even three years after the index accident, the point of limitation, it may be unclear what their future possibilities are. This is when you will obviously be considering, perhaps with the assistance of counsel, whether or not a calculation is the right way to go, or a lump sum payment, for example, a Smith and Manchester or a Blameyer award would be more relevant. Care claims, what is the nature of the care being provided? Will it remain the same? Have the claimant's injuries reached what is sometimes described in medical reports as a plateau of recovery? i.e. realistically their position is not going to change, or will their need for care get less or even disappear over time? Again, you'll be making calculations, setting out what you think is the claimant's best case and how those uh, sums do change over time. Future medical treatment. Your expert may opine that there is, for example, a 50% chance of a claimant needing a particular operation in, say, seven years' time. That sum needs to be included, discounted for risk and discounted for early receipt of the sum of money in question. And other ongoing medical treatments are perhaps more obvious, periodic treatments, or perhaps appliances also need to be considered. What I mean by that, for example, is, say, as a result of an incident, the claimant will need a hearing aid for life but that needs to be replaced every five years. So back we go to the Ogden tables to consider how many times that's theoretically going to happen. And one has to make the relevant calculations knowing what it costs today to buy the hearing aid, what the reduction is going to be for the funds being provided now, and how many times that's going to occur over the notional date of the claimant's death. Catastrophic injury cases are, of course, going to include accommodation, other transportation needs, as well as other complex medical issues. And they're beyond the scope of this bite-sized talk. The intention here was just to give you a few points to dive into with your schedules. Um, we're here at Farrah's Building to assist you with any of your needs. Please do be in contact with me or with others at Farrah's Building. Uh, do refer to our knowledge base section of the website for further bite-sized basic training sessions. And if you're interested in receiving more in-depth personalised training, don't hesitate to contact our marketing manager to discuss your requirements in detail. Given the last couple of years, we've done a lot of these uh, seminars and training on Zoom and other platforms, but we're very keen to get back to where we used to be pre-COVID, going out and seeing uh, clients and potential clients, meeting you in small groups, hopefully answering your questions and doing sessions that are slightly more detailed than this. But in any event, thank you for joining me. My email address is on the screen. If I can assist you with any questions that have arisen after today, please do not hesitate to be in touch.